Stories of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Roots of the Sons podcast with your girl and with an E. Now I took a little bit of a break just to kind of rest and recuperate but I'm back ready and recharged to give you more of your favorite episodes. So now while I was away I it was really great to know that people were still listening and still eager to to listen to the podcast and if you want to start your own podcast such as the former first lady Michelle Obama who has her own podcast on Spotify you should check it out Um, you can click on the link in the show notes which directs you to the Buzzsprout site which is the hosting site that I use which I absolutely love I recommend that you use them and it gives you an Amazon gift card as well it also, it also helps you support the show. So please go and click on the link. Now, let's get into t- today's podcast. My guest is Stephanie Atimi. She is 25 years old, originally from Nigeria, but now based in London, in the UK. She's a PhD researcher in information security at Royal Holloway University the founder and the founder of Sadia, a social enterprise focused on black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups. In this episode, we learn that Stephanie's also an artist and she combines her love of photography with her economics background. She also helps us understand how she transitioned from an economics background into cybersecurity. As a result, she is the founder of Sadia that educates women and empowers them to get into the cybersecurity field. Stephanie is enthusiastic about internet education, digital literacy, and security. As an extension of Sadia, she also hosts SciPod, which is a podcast that creates security awareness us online and she tells us more about this lastly stephanie informs us about some people who have inspired her along the journey so tune in to hear about all of this and so much more hi stephanie welcome to the show thanks for having me (laughs) i am so excited to chat with you and for my audience to just get to know more about you and everything that you do okay so let's get into it (laughs) um can you just give us an introduction about yourself like originally where you've been the sorts of things that you do okay Oh, where to start? So I'll probably say um, I'm Stephanie Timmy. I am currently 25 years old. Um, in regards to my country of origin, I'm Nigerian um, and I'm from Delta State to be specific. My dad's from Isako tribe and my mom's from Uruba tribe. Um, and in regards to what I'm doing at the moment, I'm about to start my PhD at Royal Holloway in information security. I am also the founder of Sadia, which is a social enterprise focused on helping black, Asian and minority ethnic women. And for fun, I have an art page where I manipulate um, photography and then turn it into art. So that's my passions and things that I do. Fantastic. I love that. Um, you know, and it's a good thing that you mentioned um, your passion for art because before we get into, you know, the science and all of these amazing projects that you're a part of, um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to give you an opportunity, you know, um, to, to tell us more about um, how you use the the art and like as a form of expression and um yeah can you just tell us more about that yeah sure so I'll say like my my art actually this is the first time I'm really talking about my art um is yeah 
it's a mixture of everything that I'm passionate about. So my background, I'm from an economics background. So my master's and my undergrad was in economics. And I am very passionate about the informal sector. So marketplaces, uh-huh. the fact that people can wake up and start businesses. Um, uh-huh. That inspires me because it makes me realize that, you know, people are able to come out of poverty by just their own creativity. And seeing that and the beauty in that motivates me to create art that shows that beauty. So a lot of my art is around taking pictures of marketplace and then telling different stories around that. So if you look at my art store page, it's a mixture of arts where I kind of talk about um, women in the, within the informal sector, pensioners, you know, what happens? Because if you have a formal economy, it's a thing where you know, you're the, you're the company. If you're tired, your business is tired. Um, so if you, yeah. your business is retired and it doesn't really have that longevity and, and, you know, especially in Africa, it's very different from the UK where we have benefits and, you know, social benefits I can rely on in certain African countries, you don't have such benefits. So it's a way of me um, showcasing the sector, but also showcasing labor rights within that. Um, So I take pictures of that and I try to tell the stories um, of that picture, both through a human lens, but also through a research lens as well this kind of shows my geek side I'm very much a dating (laughs) person so I kind of try to showcase all of that through my art that's so interesting so when did this start did you did you always have this passion for photography or was it like a hobby that you picked up and then like you said you combined um what you studied with and your your passion how did that even come together because that's very interesting so I think it kind of happened during my undergrad when I was, I would say, my end of my second year. I had the chance to go to Uganda to work for three months within the informal sector. It's kind of a way for me to gather research. And I just, I just thought, you know, like, this is so be- beautiful. Like, I was looking at the marketplace and I just saw so much beauty around me that I had to take a picture. Um, and in regards to how that turned into art, it was a thing where within my dissertation I wanted it to look pretty so I'm the kind of person that if whatever I'm doing when I'm writing um, research or whatever it may be if the document doesn't look pretty I can't I can't work on it (laughs) so um, I always try to find a way to beautify whether putting pictures from the internet so I decided that actually now I'm going to take pictures um of my surroundings and I'm going to include it in my dissertation um, which is what I did but because of you know data protection and privacy it had people's faces in it so I had to manipulate the pictures so you couldn't tell who the people were oh. and then when I did that yeah. I was like, wow this is kind of cool and then the passion for like turning um, photography into art came from that oh, that's so interesting that's very, very interesting. I, I love that story. And speaking um, of just, you know, understanding how all of this started, can you just um, give us um, like some of the influences that actually led you, you, you speak, you, you mentioned that you are a data geek. So how does, <laughs> how does Stephanie get into um this field as a whole in terms of everything that you do what were some of the influences did you always know or was it people around you or was it for example like you said where you went to a particular place and this happened and then it led it led you to do this can you just give us a a brief in terms of the roots of this whole um of your science in essence yeah so i think for me my upbringing was quite um interesting in the fact that I'm the only child (laughs) so really um my parents attention um and I would say my parents have been my biggest influence my mom has been my biggest influence in regards Uh to the fact that my mom had um always had like side businesses and side hustles which is where I kind of got my business mind from and with her business is a thing where it would go to places like Turkey China um Austria Turkey and will buy clothes from there and then she will sell it to the women in the market um, in Nigeria yeah. and 
you know, seeing that and, you know, speaking to this women and seeing how these women were able to have businesses within the marketplace and they were able to send their children to school really was, I would say, like the first, my first awareness of how businesses can impact people's lives in regard to economic development and how if I'm able to Uh empower a woman, how that would be able to kind of help her kids and and give them education and and like the knockoff effect of that. So I'll say like being in that environment really made me motivated of being in economics, but also knowing that I wanted to be in a field that whatever I did impacted people's lives. So I'm all about impact. So even with Sadia, it's all hiring women to give them employment within the cybersecurity sector. So I would say that that was the biggest influence in regards to even me going into art um, and my passion for the informal sector. And then my dad's more of a technical person. So my dad's you know, has an engineering background and he's he's more passionate uh-huh. about chemical engineering. But um, me and him would do things like, you know, especially like, you know, those old TVs when we're about to change TVs would, I would take off the back and see what wires were inside. Um, and I yeah. kind of had mindset of, you know, creating robots and, <laughs> um, and things of that nature. And I definitely feel like my dad had a huge influence in that, just the whole, um, science and tech side of things. You know, I definitely look up to him in that regard. And in regards to me being very data driven is because my parents, you know, I can't just make a decision like that. <laughs> Especially when I was young, I remember I was supposed to study electrical yeah. engineering, but I had changed to economics and I had to explain why. I changed to economics and I had to do research and, you know, what kind of jobs can economics um, an economics degree give me? Um, what is my earning potential? And and that thinking like that, you know, whatever decision you make, you have, my parents kind of instilled in me that you have to know the pros and cons. You have to know why you're making a decision. Uh-huh. You don't make a flimsy decision uh-huh. out of the blue. And when I was able to justify why I wanted to, you know, study economics, they let me. Um, and I think that kind of, upbringing has kind of led me to be very data driven in my decisions um and to think very rationally when i i make um decisions or things that i want to do Mm, interesting so you managed to marry like you said your mom's um the things that you learned from your mom and the things that you learned from um your dad into what you're doing so now you speak that you went and you did economics right Mm -hmm. so somebody who's probably listening is like but she's in economics how does that even (laughs) fall into the science like why is she why do we have her here so then i just want you to explain to us how you then got you are in economics you've done economics how do you then go into uh, learning about cyber security and um, and everything else. How does that happen? Oh, my journey from economics to cyber security. Yes, I think it's it's an it's an unusual journey. Um, but if I could pinpoint, like I've always been interested in yeah. tech. Um, I did ICT for GCSE A levels, um, but I fell in love with economics because I wanted to, I guess, eradicate poverty. Um, I had that mindset of, you know, helping people with jobs. And in my first year, um, after my first year at uni, I had the opportunity to work at the BBC, um, BBC Africa under their work experience program. And while I was there, um, one of the mentors that were like, you know, you instead of you trying to show that you're the best because everyone here is probably better than you because they have more experience why don't you look for things that we're not good at but you know you you are good at and then you excel in that mm. so one mm. thing i noticed at that time is they were starting up their social media and this time um they were in they had like this african fashion week now if i'm going to go back a little a little bit back in my kind of work history when I was 16 to about 18 I was a model and I was working in PR very different (laughs) um (laughs) your story (laughs) I always had a dream um to be fair I've always had a dream to be a beauty queen actually as well um I I feel (laughs) 
sports world and I was quite interested in that kind of like lifestyle and then when I was 16 I had the opportunity to work for this fashion brand called Tribal Gem and they would mix um, Ankara with jeans and you know they would go to these fashion shows so I had a lot of connects from that in regards to like YouTube influences and things of that nature so when they were doing this um, showcase on African Fashion Week I knew that that was my chance to shine so I pretty much pitch you know that I have like contacts and I was able to work and lead on certain parts of that in regards to like the coverage getting a YouTuber to like be the presenter for the day and things of that yeah. nature so because I excelled at that when I went back to uni after that work experience they called me back now this was 2014 where the Ebola um plague happened in West Africa and you know I think everybody knows that WhatsApp is rife for fake news um and they were trying yes that because you know this is a time where things are going nobody knows what the truth is people are dying in numbers um and the BBC wanted to be a voice of reason and tackle that fake news so they decided to set up the first um, public health service within whatsapp so people was essentially send their number and say you know i want to join this list and they'll be added and then the bbc will, will discuss with um medical san frontier world health organization um and unicef and then they will then bring back these legit informations or accurate information verified and then send it to people who need it so i had the opportunity to kind of do the data structuring of that project and i was able you know i had this idea of changing things and like instead of us just grouping people in different whatsapp groups why don't we do it via con- via country codes and have like a priority yeah list where we have countries who are affected by ebola virus then the second list could be surrounding countries and then the last list would be outside the continent so when i did that you know it got to a point where we had like sixteen thousand people in west africa using the service and it was a huge deal um and i'm really proud of that because i felt like during a time of chaos and when people felt a bit hopeless like we are now i was a part of a solution And that kind of set the tone in regards to me then being in more digital roles. So after that, all of the mini internships that I did centered around um, technology. And then when I graduated, my first job was within UK government, but I worked in a specific department and that department, they put me in the digital transformation um, role within the legal strategy team. So the department was going through a phase that they were going from paper forms to online forms. And it was my role as a policy advisor to help the government to kind of think what is the best way to go about that without it affecting. So, for example, if, you know, it then made me think about digital literacy, like how many people will be able to access the service? How many people, you know, are digital literate? you know have like high digital literacy skills that might be able to even access the service and is it in plain english that anybody can understand and you think about these little things you know with how you communicate because if we were to use a vague word and then somebody applied and paid a lot of money for that form they can sue us because we weren't exactly you know we weren't clear on our message so it made me really think of um just tackling digital literacy one but also thinking about what is the best way to communicate to different audiences so that was my first role now my yeah. first role was actually going into cyber security so that was me working on modern slavery human trafficking and oh. on child sexual exploitation and within that role i was working more on cyber crime um and physical crime but it was mostly looking at those topical areas and it really opened my eyes because when we tend to think about cyber security we tend to think about corporate we tend to think about finance or 419 which is like the colloquial term that they use when you're talking about nigerian scammers but we don't actually (laughs) the human side of things you know yeah like how is the internet and i think we've gotten to a place where we know the parameters of safety and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in our physical space but we haven't got there with our online space so that really opened my eyes and i'll get 
it was my foot in the door um, through cybersecurity. And at that time, I was doing my master's in economics. So I was still kind of interested in economics. Um, but now I was starting to think about, actually, you know, how do I protect women online? Um, uh. And I think what I love about the physical, um, the online space is that it's given women freedom in the sense that if we think about it historically, women haven't, especially African women, haven't had the same access to land as men. Now, when we're thinking about the digital space, you're seeing women with businesses on Instagram shop, Facebook shop. Yeah. Women are easily able to have access to digital land and digital space. And as this sort of empowerment, you know, inspires me. But then with this empowerment, how do we ensure that women are safe, um, that the vulnerable people like children also are safe online? So that was my, my transition um, from economics to cybersecurity. And now... Um, and then after that, I worked in a local government looking at smart cities, but also looking at technology and how does it impact um, communities. And now I'm doing my PhD, focusing on information security. Um, but I'm really happy because I have the chance um, within the next four years to really learn more about cybersecurity, but also to really ask and un- hopefully, I don't think I would have the answer, but at least get closer to the answer of how can we solve the most pressing problems like digital safety for women online. Ah, wow, that's, thank you so much for that um, history. And just to pick up on what you're saying that you obviously have a passion for the human rights aspect of cybersecurity. And like you said, the need to help vulnerable groups Um, well, women in particular, but the vulnerable groups such as the Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups um, who may not have access to the right of information pertaining to digital safety. And as a result, you started, um, you know, um, your organization, um, uh, SADEA. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you just tell us more um, about it because uh, while you're answering that question were you, were you doing all of this while you're working in government and you're also studying <laughs> yes I, I have a knack of uh, taking too much on not wow. by sure. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yes I was doing Sadia um, during these times <laughs> during uh, working and studying at the same time um, and Sadia did not even it didn't start with cybersecurity. Uh, okay. Actually, it, it started because um, there I saw a need for, especially within the health and social care sector, that migrant women were unable to get management jobs because they didn't have Microsoft Excel skills. So what I started doing in my local area was I started doing free Microsoft Excel workshops within my local okay. library. And at that time, I did a coding course I think 2017. So because of that, I was also quite passionate about sharing this knowledge to kids because I know that as a as a young child living in this area, I didn't have those sort of opportunities to learn coding that advance. So I wanted to give girls, especially girls from minority groups in my local area, that opportunity as well. So it started by me, you know, offering free Microsoft Excel classes and free coding coding clubs for kids in my local library. But then as it went on, a lot of the women were like, no, we want to do your job. <laughs> and this is when I was still in cy- my cybersecurity role. They were like, no, we yeah. Um, and I would send them resources, but you know, where I live and central London, it, there's a bit of a distance. And these women, they have kids, you know, they have responsibilities. They don't have the option to easily go to central London. And secondly, when they were looking Mm. at sites I was sending them, it was mostly filled with white women. It didn't really have people of color or anyone they could relate to and feel comfortable. So they didn't even feel comfortable approaching those spaces. And that's when I realized that actually there was a problem here. And even when I looked at my workplace, I was the only woman for a while. Um, and the cybersecurity, ten, especially in the UK, tends to have a lot of old military men <laughs> or um, just oh, okay. military guys entering the sector. And even by statistics, the UK um, just the um, Department for Culture and Media just released a statement this year, which showed that 15 percent of the cybersecurity sector 
are women and 16% are from minority groups. Now, when we think about being a woman and being from a minority group, I can understand that it's definitely smaller than 10%. And that's just even me being optimistic. So we have a problem. We have a diversity problem within this industry, not just even in the UK, globally it's 20% women. And if we're thinking about, you know, conversations about human rights and online space, and even, even let's say corporate, if you don't have a woman's perspective, you know, who, who, who are we really serving? Who are we really protecting? Mm. And when we're building these um, new apps, new products, are we thinking about um, a woman's perspective or safety? Or, do you know what I mean? Things of that nature. So yeah, it's a dear to be in a place where women were not only getting equipped in regards mm. to entering the workplace, but they were also getting equipped with knowledge that they need to be secure online and to even get them to think about these things so that when they are in, you know, these decision-making tables, they are able to make the right decisions that will protect women in the long run. So that's pretty much why I founded Sadia. And since then, you know, right now we do this by um, having expert webinar, webinars of cybersecurity experts to upskill this woman. Mm. But we also have virtual internships with companies to get them employment. Because I think one of the issues is, you know, even if you have the qualification, if you don't get have experience, yeah. it's difficult for you to get a job. And then finally, we're trying to make certifications a lot cheaper. Because in the UK, you're spending about 2,000 to 3,000 pounds for a certification. Wow. And it doesn't need to be that expensive, especially when in America, you can get it for a lot less. Mm. And how long have you been um, running this? So I've been running Sadia for two years now, um, but okay. we have been focused purely or solely on um, cybersecurity since January last year. Mm. No, you're doing some very important uh, work and you know, like you said, that it's it's really good to get more women of colour and I think just having you as a person um, in that space, it gives other women, um, other young girls in particular, like, hey, Steph is doing this. So this is something, this is an option for me, you know? And I think that's why it's very important to have people in the space and telling people like, hey, it's possible. And you champ- you championing um, the work so that, like you said, you can make it more affordable, more accessible, getting people employed. Because as much as, like you said, that, uh, like in, in, at the end of the day, the thing that matters is your experience. And that's what people really, um, employers rather, um, look for. And just to add on that, um, you know, you, you've got a branch from Sadia, you've got a podcast called, um, you know, SciPod, which you also a fellow podcaster. Uh, mm-hmm. So everybody should also check out her, um, her podcast and, um, you know, um, can you just tell us what you talk about, um, on that podcast and why you wanted to, to branch off and, um, add that addition into the mix? Yeah, no worries. So I think with, with SayPod, it's, it's pretty much a, um, it's like our human rights arm, um, but not mm. really in your face type of human rights. So I think with the main stuff we do, like our webinars, that deals with more of the technical skills you need to work in cybersecurity. And it's very much more career focused. While with SayPod, it gives you that commercial awareness, but also opens your mind because I feel like if you don't know, it's very difficult for you to understand what your rights are on the internet. So yeah. say, you know, the, the makeup of it, of what we talk about, we talk from about things from data privacy to, you know, who sells your, your data and how do you protect, you know, your data rights on the internet to online abuse, to even looking at home security and IOTs and how that can be linked to domestic violence. And these are things that people don't think about because, you know, especially now that people mm. have homes, they have Alexa, and Alexa recognizes you and your partner's voice. If you and your partner breaks up and your partner leaves, your partner can easily enter back into the house if they know that the Alexa still works. And those, you know, wow. if you think about locking your house, but mm. you don't think about changing the voice settings on your Alexa. So, you know, it's just giving and bringing those knowledge of things 
to the forefront to even simple things like oversharing on the internet and social engineering mm. with the what's um not whatsapp hack with the twitter hack that was a social engineering um attack and social engineering is essentially me manipulating somebody else to give me information so in the most simplest form it's thinking about love rats and how guys can promise women love and then women will give them insane amount but when you when it gets more sophisticated it's as simple as someone calling a bank um saying that you know they want to get into their husband's bank account yeah husband is in the hospital they'll give a sub story and they can put noises in the background to show us if like they have kids um that are crying and then you listen on the phone you feel sorry for that one like wow her husband is in the hospital and she has how many kids that she has to take care of let me help her now when you think yeah. about stuff like that it really you know you if you're in that case you're more likely to give that information more than if you were in a normal you know position so because of that it's a lot because of that it's a lot easy for you to divulge information now if we're talking about oversharing on social media and let's say i am someone who's a harry potter fan and i post a lot of things about harry potter someone can easily send me an email saying something um harry potter concert I'm more likely uh. to click on that email because I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. And, you know, and that's how someone can easily even get into my computer. So it's just those social engineering things that people have to be careful about. So we talk about different things like that, just to give people that information of like, this is, if you want to increase your safety on the internet, these are the things you need to do. Yeah. And I think... Um, you're absolutely right. This is a type of information, especially in this day and age when we do everything on the internet, how we, so much, so many of us are getting more and more dependent on our devices, on our social media accounts. And, um, you know, I was telling you off air that I was listening to one of your recent episodes and, um, you were talking to a data, uh, a digital data broker. And I was like, mind blown i didn't even know that that is a like i mean i know of a financial broker but it's just stuff like that that i think people who are not in the cyber security or it or information security i think everyday people need to get more informed with this sort of information no i totally agree and and you know that's why i did the podcast because i also wanted it to be i wanted the information to also be um how would i say I wanted people to be able to digest the information in small bites, but in a way that was accessible. Because when people think about cybersecurity, they think about um, it being very technical and hard to understand. But the podcast is kind of a way to demystify that and make it very easy and conversational that mm. any understand, you know, what people are talking about or what the risks are out. So that's, that's the reason why I definitely uh, wanted to create the podcast well it's it's fantastic so um steph you know you you are (laughs) you are a tech founder you are an artist you are a phd researcher you are a podcaster you are you you are working you know this is a lot (laughs) and you know these are a lot of balls that you have in the air um, I'm sure somebody listening is like, how does she do it? So how do you manage to keep all of these balls in the air? And, um, you know, if so, what are some of the challenges? Cause I'm sure it's not easy. It, it looks easy on the outside, but uh, like, how do you do it? What's the secret? You know, when people ask this question, it's, it's, you know, I, I'm even, I even wonder how I'm able to do all of these, but I would say like the few things that I do in terms of like practical tips is I have an insane amount of um, notebooks (laughs) and I have a planner where I write my to-do list just, just to keep myself accountable. Um, and I don't, I think another thing which it could either be a blessing or a curse is that I don't see things as a big deal. So, you know, okay. even like as an event, I just think if we were doing an event, let's say pre-COVID, 
I just need a speaker. I need a space. And I need to advertise. That's an event. And I think about it in those steps. So it doesn't seem like a huge deal to me. But for some another person, it might seem like a huge deal. And like with podcasts, I just see it as, you know, find the speaker, write the questions, have a conversation. Like I'm having a conversation. Yeah. So because of that, it doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Now with Sadia, obviously there are many things that we do, but because I'm passionate about it as well, it doesn't feel like work. Um, uh-huh. So and even when I was working, all the jobs I did had a social impact element to it. So again, it felt like I was fulfilling my purpose and not that I was at work, if that makes sense. So because of that, I would say it, things are a lot easier for me, but I understand that not everyone is like that, um, which is why even you know when I talk to people, I try to make it clear, like, not everybody has the capacity to handle that many projects at once, but I do. And I think it's only because I'm able to see those things that I need to do as small bits and not a huge thing that I need to get off my to-do list. Ah. Yeah, so insane amount of notebooks and uh, to-do lists are the <laughs> the keys to your success. Oh, no, wait, and also um, not thinking that everything is a big deal. So those are like your three takeaways for people who are listening. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you've told us your secrets, and um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, um, you spoke of your mom and your dad earlier about them being – you know, influences in terms of where you are now, but are there other people who along this journey helped you when you look back and you take that moment of gratitude, you're like, you know what? So-and-so has been, um, if they were influential in helping me get to where I am being the woman that I am, um, apart. Well, you mentioned your parents, but is there anybody else who you, who you would like to mention? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, it it was when I think about it, um, before I worked at the BBC, I I had confidence, but I wouldn't say my confidence was at a top notch. (laughs) Um, I was still a kid trying to make my way in the world. And I was really inspired by... I'll call them because, you know, they're Africans. I'm going to call them Auntie Bola and Auntie um, Vivian. Um, and the reason why I mentioned it to her, I remember the Aunt Vivian, when I got to um, the BBC, she was like, you're very stiff and you're very corporate, but don't worry, by the end of this experience, we'll make a journalist out of you. And I'm grateful to her because she really taught me how yeah. to be curious about things. And she taught me how to try things um, and how to not be scared of failure, not be scared of people saying no. So I really appreciate her. And with Aunt Bola, she really taught me about never giving up, you know, because I had the opportunity to learn their stories and learn how they were able to navigate the 80s, you know, and even much uh-huh. and pursuing a career in journalism. And especially with Aunt Vivian, she was, you know, she had a show where she was interviewing first ladies of African presidents, like, you know, first ladies of African countries. And that really, yeah, wow. And then I would say my second stage would probably be when I went to Uganda. And going to Uganda really opened my eyes because it made me realize that uh, a lot of things are vanity. Um, I mean, it's good, it's nice to look good. And I'm not, um, I like to look good. I'm not um, Uh. trying to say that, you know, I'm holier than thou or whatever. But it made me realize that there is more to this. And every time I go through a situation and when things get hard, because having a business is very difficult and isolating. Yeah. The bigger picture. Like this is bigger than me. And I think about times where I've seen people and how they've been able to struggle and work hard. And even the examples that I gave with those women who were able to work in the marketplace and were able to send their children to school, that inspired me. Uh Um, Even now going to me being in the workplace, and then there was someone I met, Basola. She was amazing. My first job, she taught me everything. How to send emails, <laughs> um, how to navigate yeah. different conversations at work. And most recently, Auntie Bukum. <laughs> she inspired me 
just in cybersecurity and also learning learning how to speak up for yourself in the workplace and in and at times where it's difficult learning how to stand for yourself so i'll say that those women have been very instrumental in my growth as well as my friends but you know i have so many friends i feel like if i start mentioning people i don't want anyone to feel left <laughs> but left out yeah my friends as well, as well they've been so inspiring because you know i talk about these big figures but seeing your friends day to day and seeing them have dreams like you have dreams and seeing them work at it that motivates you as well so i'm so grateful for the people around me i'm so grateful for my support system and although it may seem like oh i'm doing this by myself i am a product of many people is what i'll say yeah yeah definitely i'm also a firm believer that you know um you are not an island and um You know, there's that African saying that you are, I am because you are. So, um, you know, the whole theme of Ubuntu, that's very big here in in South Africa. So um, I love that you are able to mention that there are all these significant people who were who are instrumental, especially your friends. I think sometimes, like you said, that we can say there are all these big figures, but the people who are you know, who are keeping you grounded. Uh, those those people are also very, uh, sometimes a little bit more important actually and just motivating you to be like, oh my word, so-and-so is doing this. Um, and they kind of push you to level up. So shout out to your friends as well. Friends are really good <laughs> as well. Um, just in closing, Steph, um, you, you mentioned all of these people who have inspired you, but I'm sure... To many, you are quite inspiring um, as well. So I just want to ask you, what advice would you give to a young African, be it a female, um, who wants to get into this career that you're in? You mentioned the stats earlier that it's very, the numbers are are very very low so what advice would you would you give to somebody who's interested in this um in this field of yours okay so i probably will start with again data i would say do your research um especially if you're approaching people and you want mentors it's always good to show that you've done the work in regards to research so if you know you want to work in Uh. science or you want to work in tech or you want to work in cyber security think about okay how do i get work experience there first of all you want to you want to have a taste of the field and don't be afraid to reach out to people on linkedin um i would say you know 18 and above preferably <laughs> don't just speak to train um, yeah. but i would say speak speak to people in those field and try and get a, a sense whether it's by coffee or whether it's by um, shadowing or work experience try to get a feel of what are the different industries out there and then, you know, I'll say Google is free before you even start approaching people. And then the second tip I'll say is once you know what you want to do, it's then for you to then think, okay, what, who are the main figures in this field? You know, who, who are the movers and shakers? And then look at their path. Like, what did they do that was different? Did they do a specific course? Did they, uh, ah. were they here and what makes them special? And then think about, okay, this is what made them special. Let's say, you know, you're maybe looking at people in New York and you're in South Africa or Mozambique, for example. Then think about, okay, how can I replicate that opportunity here? Let's say it's volunteering. What organizations are around? And I would say one thing is that it's very easy for people to um, have dealings with the UN and with um, multi bilateral organizations in Africa than it is in the West. So look for, Uh is there any US aid around you? Is there any World Bank initiative? Like what is around you? And then volunteer, you know, you want to stand out. And if it's a thing where you're passionate about science or you're passionate, let's say you're passionate about cybersecurity or you're passionate about don't give up your music dream. Think about ways, how can you merge it together? You know, I'm sure in the music industry, there's probably hacks, hacking hacking celebrities, hacking um, systems of like music record companies. Think about, okay, maybe I should go to record companies, ask them questions, 
see how I can get a role within that industry because I want people to know that you know you don't have to give up different aspects of yourself because you're chasing a dream like I said yeah. I like art and I like cyber security and I like economics and, I'm, and I found a way to merge all these so don't feel like you have to be stuck in one box is another thing I want to say feel very free to explore um, I know it's so cliche I know but right now is the best time to fail <laughs> it's the best time to fail while you're young and you don't really have responsibilities because by failing it teaches you lessons you know I've learned so much more from my failures than even my successes because I'm like yeah. I'm to do that again so that will probably be my advice and my tips research explore different fields and don't be afraid to be your authentic self Uh fantastic and also don't be scared of failure that is very 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 true that one is is, as cliche as it sounds there's a reason why it's cliche because it's true (laughs) so um yeah stephanie thank you so much for chatting with us um today It, it was lovely having you and just um you talking us through your journey and how you got here no worries thank you so much for inviting me and um shout out to the listeners <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's, it's been a pleasure and like you said to the listeners as usual thank you so much for tuning in and listening to another episode of the root of the Sons podcast with your girl and with an e until next time goodbye